wanted to make a video to say thank you. Thank you for being so supportive all the time while I was at Maribel College. Uh, you were a great teacher. You were a great example of what a teacher should be. And I really thank you for all those classes and all those moments that I had with you and that uh, you could share your expertise with me. And also for being such a great human. Um, you've always been so um, patient uh, with all of us that were your students, especially with me uh, while I was learning um, um, how to become a teacher in a country that was not my own. So um, I really thank you for that. I also thank you for uh, helping me out whenever I needed um, some signatures from you when I was in Mexico. That was like a really um, stressful time, but you were there for me and you were always willing to help me even through the distance. And, and I am so proud to call Terry Simpson a good friend of mine. Uh, I was young when I joined the faculty at the college and uh, I guess subconsciously I looked around trying to find a faculty member I could emulate. Um, someone I wanted to be like as a faculty member. It wasn't long before um, I, I, I guess I, I saw Terry Simpson as my mentor. And everyone watching this knows why that is. Uh, Terry, simply stated, is a stellar teacher. Hi Dr. Simpson. This is your Maryville College colleague upstairs, Dan Klingensmith from the History Department. Uh, and I just want to thank you for 20 years of leadership and mentorship uh, and of just being a great colleague. I want to thank you for letting me teach ethics with you um, during many Januaries uh, um, over the years. Um, I learned a lot about ethics. I learned a lot about um, religion and philosophy. I learned a lot about theology. I learned uh, how to articulate my own views of the subject. Um, I sure learned a lot about how to teach a class just from watching you. Um, I won't say that I can be as good as the master, but I certainly did pick up some stuff in uh, those many Januaries that we spent teaching together. Uh, I also learned always to be careful who you choose to debate with because nobody is ever going to beat Terry Simpson at debating. Um. We've taught together, we've worked a little bit together, uh, we live in the same neighborhood, um, and I'm going to miss you a lot. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that I said that. But I also want to say that I've always thought of you as a teacher of teachers. Um, and maybe that's because of the, uh, the times that we have taught ethics together and we've had you know, many of our licensure students in class, but um, what is so clear to me from that experience is that uh, you really understand teaching in some ways to be a sacred work. and. That has meant a lot to me, and it has shaped my teaching, I hope, um, over these past years. Uh. Hey, Dr. Simpson, Terry Brown here. I am so saddened that you'll be leaving Maribel College, but I am very excited that you get to enter into this age of retirement. It has been such an honor to be uh, one of your students and to have learned underneath you my four plus years in the Maribel College Teaching Licensure was some of the best. And I thank you for your dedication to all of us as student teachers and your dedication to the profession that is education and for empowering us to go out and to teach the world and to empower our students as you empowered us. So best wishes to you as you embark on this new phase of life, and I wish you all the best. Bye. Hey, Dr. Simpson, this is Kevin Fowler, class of 2008, uh, coming to you from Apple Park, you see in the background there. And I, I thought it fitting, uh, Dr. Simpson, because I don't believe that I could be where I'm standing today uh, without you. 
Um, so I want to thank you, sir, for such a, a long, productive and fruitful career of educating, um, you know, thousands of Lysinger students, but in turn, you've impacted the millions of students that have been under us over the years. Um, and what, what an amazing career it's been. And sir, I, I just want to thank you for uh, taking a chance on a kid from Vaughn <laughs> a kid from Monroe County. And I have a feeling that was because somewhere down the line, there was someone who took a chance on a kid from Loudoun County. So uh, once again, Dr. Simpson, congratulations on a full career. College. You're influential because you believe in every student, no matter who they are or where they come from. And that taught me to believe in every student I've had. And I may not be in a public school classroom like I thought I would when I was in your classroom, but I do continue to teach. I teach in the church, and a lot of that is also due and credit to you. Because your faith shined through and you showed me that education and faith can go hand in hand. Terry, uh, on, upon your retirement, I want to say it's been an honor and a pleasure to be your colleague for the past 21 years. Um, when I think of you, I think of a true teacher. You've integrated your faith and your profession in the spirit of the one they call teacher. You not only challenge and equip your students with new knowledge, information, but you mentor them uh, to be teachers in the world. To not only teach their students, but to care about them to minister to them in the best sense of the word. Thank you, Dr. Simpson, for everything in all these last four years. Thank you for being the grandfather of the education department. And thank you for believing in me when no one else did. Thank you again. Have a really good retirement. The impact and respect that his colleagues has for him really can't be measured. He leaves, he leaves a legacy for us to celebrate and to continue, and that's our challenge. So, Terry Simpson, I wish you all the best. I am proud to have worked in an institution where Terry Simpson has trained teachers who have gone out into the public sphere and have worked with many of the same concerns and the same love for children that they have seen in him. And this is a legacy that won't end with retirement. Their careers will go on and on, and the students that they train and that they help raise will continue on. So it's an ever-flowing stream. Terry, of course, we wish you good rest and good health and much joy in retirement. And we send you our thanks and our love. So we went to Barlett 101, and I was there with three or four other girls who really wanted to be teachers, and I was not really that interested. But we went in and sat down, and you were the person who came into the room. And I had no idea who you were, but the minute you started talking, your passion, your passion was so contagious, and your care for others was so evident that I knew that if I was going to be a teacher, you were the exact teacher I wanted to be. And I am so thankful that I got to go through four years of college with you teaching me how to be that person.
Wow, look at all these people. I love it. Good afternoon. I'm Tom Bogart. I'm the president of Maryville College, and I am excited to see you all here, and I know why we're all here today. Maryville College, Maryville College's mission emphasizes that our role is to prepare students. And of course, Dr. Simpson, as a professor, epitomizes someone who uh, cares for challenges and prepares students. But more than that, of course, his, the students he is preparing, he is preparing to go out and prepare students of their own. And that is a great leap into the unknown. We don't know what on earth is gonna happen. We educate students and they leave, and then they're educating other students and they're leaving, and we have no idea where that's going. And to me, in thinking about Dr. Simpson's career, and when I think about Terry as a person, the word that always comes to me is that he's a, he's a person of faith. And that act of preparing students and sending them off into the world to prepare other students and, and into the future epitomizes to me the, the definition of faith that the author of Hebrews gives. The, the evidence of things unseen, the substance of things hoped for. For by it, he certainly has re earned a good report here at Maryville College and beyond. And of course, the author of Hebrews, like we are going to do today and, and at other times, celebrates some of those heroes of faith. And Terry Simpson has certainly been that for all of us. But even more importantly, we're reminded that surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and this is a pretty good cloud of witnesses we've got right here, we should throw off weight and run the course that is set before us. And certainly Terry has done and continues to do that. And I hope that what his career has done for all of us is prepare us to, to help run that race and what his life has done and will continue to do for all of us is to challenge us uh, to, to follow that example and run that good race. So welcome to this afternoon. Welcome to Maryville College. Thank you for being here. As many of you know, faith has been a significant part of my dad's life. But this faith has never been used as a hammer to beat others down. He simply wants you to hear the several songs that we're gonna to sing today, the hymns, and just carry them with you on your journey through the schools, through life, through everything that you do. Because we, all of us, are on a, on a pilgrimage and may you be encouraged on your journey by the words of these hymns. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands than to be Oh, be hey. 
Jesus than anything this world affords today. Thank you for that. I was reminded today that uh, already, and I don't know how many of my former students are here, but two of them remember me best for telling them to pee or get off the pot. So <laughs> Terry also always said we were quite different. I believe that to be true. When uh, Dr. Simpson joined us at Maryville College, uh, it was a critical time for the teacher education program. Uh, the college had just determined that it was going to reactivate uh, its teacher education program, which basically had been suffering from not so, not so, uh, well, what's the word that I want to use? Benign, I think. Not so benign neglect. And uh, with, uh, and coincidentally, at that same time, the state of Tennessee was developing a set of new uh, standards that all 33 of the colleges that had teacher education programs at that time in Tennessee needed to pass or reach or get over or whatever words you choose to use. So. Uh, those two things were going on all at the same time. And in addition to that, uh, we needed then to produce a program that one, met the needs of the students of Maryville College. That should always be a primary goal of a program that you're going to introduce. Does it meet the needs of the students? Secondly, a program that was focused on the strengths of the liberal arts faculty of Maryville College. You may have noticed that four of the videos that you saw were from liberal arts college faculty. And the fact that they praised Terry as an exemplar of good teaching is really, that's exactly what needed to happen. We needed to get in the good graces again of the faculty at Maryville College. They needed to believe that we could do what was best for the college and best for the students. And obviously, there are more than those four, but those four. Are anybody, is there anybody here that's a faculty member at Maryville College? Yes, there are. So I would say that uh, one of the things we did do was to build on the strengths of our liberal arts faculty and rebuild the frayed but crucial ties with that faculty. You cannot have a teacher education program without a faculty that buys into it, particularly at Maryville College. You'd be wasting three quarters, five, nine, five eighths, 90%, maybe that much, of the talent if you did not use the faculty. So we put our nose into everybody's business. And Terry was very good at putting his nose into everybody else's business. <laughs> I said, you take that one, Terry. He said, OK. So in any event, um, with that good graces, with those good graces going on, with the faculty, we also needed to rebuild 
the ties with the area schools, the area principals and teachers. Those had also been frayed. Uh, they were not happy to see me coming to ask them if they'd be interested in taking student teachers. Are there any teachers who were supervising teachers or any principals here tonight? Yes, there are. My goodness, I guess we must have done that part of the job too. That is, we rebuilt those crucial ties. And all by, in addition to doing all of this, we had one more key thing that we needed to do, and that was to meet the new state standards for approval. At this juncture, there have been six such visits by the state to look at the Maryville College teacher education program. All of those six visits resulted in approval or reapproval of the Maryville College teacher education program. Now, of course, I can say that was all my doing for the first two, but I wasn't even here for the last ones. That was Terry and the current faculty that carried that out. And by the way, I wouldn't take credit for the first two either. <laughs> Not by myself, for sure. So Terry knew all of this when he came to interview for the position. Uh, I thought of lying, but there's something about his gaze. You know? <laughs> I'm going to lie to Terry. <clears throat> I told him that uh, this was the case. We had a lot of work ahead of us, and he said, I'll accept the challenge. And it turned out to be a great fit with the rest of the college, Terry did. A needed piece of a puzzle. Dr. Simpson had the temperament, the experience at the secondary level. He had the vision, the vision of what the program could be. And he had an understanding of the area because he was from the area. And that really needed to be, it was a crucial part of the program. He understood the students way better than I did. You might notice I talk funny. <laughs> well, and I'm clipped, and I say things like, pee you get off the pot, you know. So anyhow, uh, we were very different, but we were agreed on one crucial area. That is, we wanted the best that we could provide for the college. And the final thing, which I'm sure you all know about Terry already, was that he worked very, very hard. Very hard. So, uh, you notice I'm doing a lot of reading of this because I'm used to an hour and 15 minute classes. And I thought, if I don't time myself down to a script, I'm really going to blow the schedule. So, anyhow. And it's also pollen time in East Tennessee, isn't it? We just got through that in South Carolina. Anyhow, it's uh, important to note that Terry both demonstrates and promotes excellence in teaching and learning. And you heard on the tapes the college professors saying this about him. That's what they respected the most. He demonstrates and promotes excellence in teaching and learning. He has won the Outstanding Teacher Award three times over the course of his tenure, as determined by student vote, by the way. The number of students here this evening also attests to his impact as a teacher. We do have students here tonight, don't we? Yes, okay. Thank you. In addition to that, the second phase says of that phrase, the second part of that phrase rather says, demonstrates and promotes excellence in learning. It requires that an excellent teacher, that statement requires that an excellent teacher ponder, think about things. Has it been your impression that Terry ponders and thinks about things? <laughs> yes, for sure. And in addition to that, they need to be intrigued by ideas. 
that they wonder about stuff. They ask questions. They explore. They seek information. They share their knowledge. And they, in effect, notice things. In my considered opinion, there is no way, if you're not interested in learning, how could you possibly inspire your students to be interested in learning? You can't. I, you should pack it in if you cannot be interested in learning yourself. At least in my humble opinion. <laughs> I've had somebody tell me I've never had a humble opinion in my life. <laughs> oh dear. <clears throat> Anyhow, <laughs> in, uh, as far as Terry is concerned, he's been awarded two different Fulbright scholarships, one to Estonia and one to Saudi Arabia. And he's lectured and taught, it says, in Philippines, Haiti, and Brazil. Now, I want you to listen to those places. Nowhere does it say England or Ireland or Canada. It says Estonia, Saudi Arabia, the Philippines, Haiti, and Brazil. Uh, the interest in the world uh, talks about Terry's interest in knowing and his interest in continuing to learn. It's impressive. Of course, in addition to that, he chaired the division uh, and he uh, was the director of teacher education. And he wrote, a, by the way, sort of in an off moment, I guess, he wrote it a math science partnership grant on rural education in southern Appalachia, region of the United States. And I don't know if you've looked at his blog, but I find it interest, I find it thought, pro thought provoking and sometimes it touches my heart. Well, Terry, you're about to embark on your next best new thing. Unstructured time. <laughs> what a blessing that is. Uh, you have served as Maryville College, uh, you've served Maryville College, rather, as a professor, the director of teacher education, Supervisor of Student Teachers and Chair of the Division of Education, and in the spare time, as I said, wrote that grant. And somehow, all of this happened all during the same time. The structuring of your time at the Maryville College has been a test to your skills, your patience, your endurance, and your ability to make a day 28 hours long. Now you'll have the whole day before you to fill as you wish. Enjoy your children and the glories of Texas and whatever else may lie out there waiting for you. We all have come here this afternoon to mark this occasion with you, to show by our presence how important you are to all of us. Carry on, Terry.
afternoon, everyone. My name is Rachel Rushworth Hollander, and I am a 2008 graduate of Maryville College, English for Teacher Licensure, and I actually teach at Maryville High School down the road. It is my absolute honor and pleasure to introduce today's presentation by Dr. Terry Simpson. I hesitate to call it his last lecture, because if you're like me, you're still holding out for more lectures and life lessons after this day still. Last year, when Dr. Simpson announced that he would be retiring from Maryville College, I began thinking, how in the world are we going to honor this wonderful man and his colossal influence? Obviously, I said to myself, we'll have a town-wide parade, probably a national holiday. School's gonna be canceled in the Upper East Tennessee area. Doves are gonna be released at some point and one, maybe two statues on campus. I don't know why, none of these ideas actually happened, although I'm holding out for a statue, Dr. Bogart. <laughs> but in truth, the man who will stand before us today wouldn't want any of those things. His humility would never deal with such pomp and circumstance. And so here we are, gathered in fellowship, of students, teachers, colleagues, and family, to celebrate this man and to listen intimately, which is in fact much more fitting. And speaking of who's here, Look around, he has drawn quite a crowd as we knew he would, and it truly shows what an impact he has had as an educator in his years of service. Many of us have the honor of calling Dr. Simpson our teacher, someone who guided us and helped us become the educators that we are today. If you are a past or present student of Dr. Simpson, raise your hand, please. Very good. Some here have worked alongside him as a colleague and a friend, witnessing the behind the scenes, blood, sweat, and tears it takes to be a college professor, and probably telling some stories about those of us that just raised our hands. <laughs> Don't have to share mine now. The smallest and luckiest bunch here today call him husband, father, grandfather, other terms of endearment. And my guess is you guys heard a few lessons over the years as well. But we all know it's no secret just how much Dr. Simpson loves his family and how proud he makes them. But regardless of why you're here today, we're all connected. One of his many blessed children, you might even say. And just like education itself, Dr. Simpson has managed to teach and expand our minds, taking us from what we were and forever changing and helping mold us into who we are today. His influence spans states and continents, years and decades, content areas and age groups, and so many changes in standardized testing. <laughs> Yet here we are, connected today, to recognize and appreciate just how influential a truly great educator can be. And now I know what you're all thinking at this point, aren't we here to hear him today? And the answer is yes, so I will gladly step aside for a truly great educator. I will try to get through this, okay? <laughs> Those 28 years, 28 hours, days I worked, I think there's one person here that you need to go up and hug her neck for staying with me during those days. That's my precious wife, Deborah, who's sitting right down here. One of my stepdaughters, Meg. Meg, raise your hand, okay? My son-in-law, Jeffrey. You heard Jennifer, Daniel, Savannah, Isabella. I'm not gonna name cousins and uncles and aunts, okay? <laughs> Stop there. But it's been, it's been quite a journey from Davis Elementary School on Davis Ferry Road in Loudoun, Tennessee in a little school that the only vision I had, I guess, was just to be a history teacher. I loved history. And Maddie Hicks was my seventh and eighth grade teacher. And I fell in love with history while she was teaching me. But all the other things that have happened, 
You know, people say have a five-year plan, a three-year plan or something. I didn't have a plan, okay? The deal was when the train of opportunity comes by, get on board. It may not come by again. And I've tried to live that way. My family has, has been precious. And I, I want to talk about our parents just a moment. That's my Bonnie and Clyde picture of my dad and mom, okay? That's all I think about when I see that. So maybe that's true, maybe it's not. But my mother, so did my father, grew up in a farm family. My mother had in a family of nine, much of it during the Great Depression, trying to make a living on a, on a little country farm in one of these valleys. And it was very, very hard to do. I can remember my mother saying that, you know, they had to work outside just like the men did. And so there's, there wasn't a lot of wealth to go around. This, in fact, is the only picture I have of my mother related to marrying my father. And I didn't know I even had that until my sister passed away not long ago. And I found it. She dropped out of school in the 10th grade. My dad quit school in the sixth to work. And I asked my mother, why did you drop out of school? She said the other students made fun of the clothes she had to wear. You know, kids can do that. They can be quite vicious. And we would go through our little hometown of Loudoun. And if somebody was walking down the street, street she went to school with, her next statement was either they were nice to her or they made fun of her. You never forget those things. And I've tried to instill that in my teachers as we go along. My wife's family, her dad, Billy Barnes, same picture on either side of her mom, okay, same person. He flew the hump in India and China, re resupplying the Chinese soldiers that were fighting the Japanese in World War II. One of the most dangerous missions that any pilot could have in World War II and before. And uh, he was killed in a training mission after the war when Deborah was five. And so Deborah's mother was left with three small children to raise sort of by herself. But it was, uh, it, 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 it's, it was a great feat that I think she accomplished. Some of you don't know about this. <laughs> this is my other life. Again, Deborah took some black and white pictures and really worked with these and I, we've got several of these around. I'm not gonna tell you what I was doing. We had a few disagreements and he always won. <laughs> when I was taking care of the cattle around our house, I, it was my job to feed about 30 cows and when they calved, you know, all the babies. And so before I came to Maryville College to work, you know, that morning, come to the office, I was usually up at five feeding these, these cattle. And we started rolling hay and I would set the, the roll down on the hillside and cut the twine and then get behind the roll and push it, and it will totally unroll going down a hill. And my cattle would eat that up every day. One day I set the roll down, cut the twine, started pushing it down the hill, and it wouldn't move. So I pushed and I pushed, then I got behind it, you know, and pushed like that. And I finally said, what in the world's on the other side of this roll of hay? It was this guy trying to push it up the hill. <laughs> now I'm gonna tell you, if I'd been on the other side, it'd been Katie bar the door, right? <laughs> so learned a lot there. This is a picture of my dad. He was injured while training in World War II, did not go overseas, but he guarded 
prisoners from the European theater in, in Louisiana. And he had the privilege, and I think it was a privilege, of guarding some of the Africa Corps of General Rommel after he was defeated in North Africa. And he told me how disciplined these soldiers were, even in captivity. And they stayed in shape and they exercised and all the things you do. But he's a big talker, so he, he got to know this Italian soldier. And the Germans didn't think much of the Italians. They sort of put them out in front and let them try to stop things. And so <laughs> he asked this guy, they named him Pee Wee. And he said, Pee Wee, how did you get captured? And he finally convinced him and he, he got to the side and got a stick and drew a line and said, Germans, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Another line and said, Americans, boom, boom, boom. Right down the middle of your line said, Pee Wee. <laughs> I'll never forget that. When he died, one of his friends came up to me, I never knew this, and said, your dad told me that when you were born as a baby, he said, I'm going to let him go to school as long as he wants to. And he had a great vision for that because I can remember my mother trying to help him pass a civil service exam and he really couldn't read the booklet. And I realized what that was like. So in the third grade, we took my piggy bank to the bank. And I told everybody at Davis in the third grade that I had $500 in my piggy bank. It was actually $35.18. <laughs> and then we went to the Sweetwater Stockyard and bought a little heifer calf. Brought that calf back home. And every year when that calf, a new calf was sold off of that cow, it went into that little savings account, my college account. Now, I'm going to have to be real colorful here. You want to get the import of what he said. He said, you take money out of this account and waste it on a car, and I will beat your ass. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Marcia and I remembered my first days here about the same. I was wondering what she was going to say. I may have to change some of this, but <laughs> she sent me, first of all, out to Heritage High School to place a student teacher in the spring. Ben Dalton was the principal. And I went into Ben's office and I said, who, told him who I was and we needed to place a student teacher at Heritage. And he said, I don't know about that. He said, the last student teacher that you had here, nobody ever come, came to observe you. This person was here the whole time with that one observation. And then she sent me to a middle school with a principal that I will not name, who was a graduate of Maryville College, and he was mad at the college. And he started in on me for about an hour. And I said, wait a minute, I've only been at work two weeks, you've got to give me long enough to fix it. <laughs> but, but what we discovered is that the trust was not there. You have to have trust, you know. You have to have trust with schools. They have to trust you and all the other things. And I told Marshall, I said, you know, we have got to be in the schools on a regular basis. And we committed at that time that somebody from Maryville College would be in that classroom every week. And there were times during a semester I put a thousand miles on my truck when I was supervising all of them. But that trust was built. And I told a lot of people I wanted to get to the place where a principal could call me and say, I need an English teacher, do you have anyone? And that means they're gonna trust who I send to them. And we got there. Help from lots of people. The other thing, a teacher must be able to adjust to all situations. Is it bent? That's good. Is that good? Yeah, Leave your good. glasses alone. Leave my glasses alone? Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
We, we must adjust to all situations and be flexible. My great story comes from my fifth grade. Uh, up until the fifth grade in Loudoun County, there was a one-room schoolhouse at Poplar Springs. And in the fifth grade, they closed that school and moved them to Davis. And the teacher for all eight grades at that one-room schoolhouse was Miss Ursa Giles. And so she came, she came to, to Davis and was teaching the fifth grade, and it was the morning. And we had social studies, and she had the textbook and was asking us questions over things we were supposed to have read. And we had those big, remember the big windows in the old schools, you know, big tall windows with blinds? She put out a folding chair, and why she did this, I do not know. She stepped up in that folding chair to correct the blind. And when she did, the chair folded. And we were sitting there, oh my Lord. <laughs> and somehow the chair caught her heel. And when she hit the, hit the ground, she rolled over on her shoulder, came right back up on her feet, didn't drop the book. The page didn't even move. <laughs> you guys come back, Jennifer. Uh, and that, that was... Uh, that was very interesting to watch that. <laughs> I tell my new teachers, I just tell my new teachers they'll have to pass a physical test. <laughs> okay. This is Amy. She was Amy Hoover here. And Amy went to Houston, Texas and taught with Teach for America. This young man is from Iraq. And he was a second grader, and he'd been in four different countries, four different schools in one year. And he cried every day. By the year's end, he was reading on grade level. And Amy Hoover was named one of the 25 top educators in Houston, Texas. And I've talked to her many times. And she said, you taught us what good teaching was about. And if you know how to teach, you can teach at all levels. And she was right. <laughs> Y'all yeah, children remember how you make them feel. My mother felt very sad about people making fun of her clothes. And sometimes to give confidence to a child, the teacher has to believe in the child before the child can believe in himself or herself. Do you know that? They have to know there's somebody out there that believes in me. My freshman year in high school in Algebra One, we had two sections. I was in one section, which I don't think they thought would last very long. <laughs> and I remember one unit we had, Lois Snow, were you here somewhere? Now Lois was one of the, in the bright group. I was in the other group. <laughs> I thought I saw you. <laughs> and it was a very difficult unit that we were covering. And Lois, I'm going to tell you, this is true. I made the highest grade in both classes. And Stanley Gallion, you remember Stanley Gallion? Oh, don't roll your eyes. He was all right. <laughs> he told me that I should consider going into a field that had a lot of math in it. Well, I didn't do that, but he believed I could. And that's what made the difference. Okay. I don't know if she's here today. There's a student here, he's a senior student teaching. And in her sophomore year, she called me and asked me what she made on the test. And I told her it was posted on Blackboard. And she looked at it and called me back and said, I can't believe I did that well on that exam. And I said, listen here, I believe in you. Now you believe in yourself. And she's had a wonderful experience, I think, in student teaching. I remember one of the sad times, my first year at Cedar Bluff Middle School, 
I had a young lady in the seventh grade who had been raped by an uncle when she was in the sixth grade. And I walked by her de desk one day and touched her on the arm and she went totally rigid. I'm going to tell you something, my friend. It is sad when a little girl does not have a daddy that'll come up and hug her and protect her. And I've never forgotten that, that experience. Connection with parents, essential. When I was at Cedar Bluff and we'd have open house and, you know, teacher day and parent day, we had to, we couldn't have them all at the same night because we would block traffic on Cedar Bluff all the way back to I-40. And so we had to stagger the open house events and the times when parents came to, to meet with us. And when I moved to Texas and then started teaching high sixth school in Greenville, Texas, troubled, troubled high school, the first open house, I went by the auditorium and looked at PTA meeting. There were seven board members at a table giving a report. And in the whole auditorium listening to this report were four parents. And the only time I talked with parents was when somebody was about to be kicked out of school. I remember the superintendent or director of schools called me one morning and they had arrested one of my students as he pulled a knife on somebody. And he asked me, he said, have we helped this young man all we can? Lord help, why you wanna ask me that question for? And I, I decided then I've got to figure out a way to draw in positive folks. So what I decided to do was start calling parents. This was a year or two before internet and email. I still would rather call than send an email to somebody I don't know. And the reason I'd rather do that is because I can read their expression. In email, you can't. And uh, I had this young lady in the ninth grade, American history, named Tressa. Tressa was hell on wheels. Any rule, she would break it. So the principal comes on the intercom system and said, do not go barefoot in this school. Put your shoes on. Tressa comes jockeying down the hall, you know, with her shoes tied in a string and slinging over her shoulders just as barefoot as she could be. Just to do, just to do what, was, what was different. She was very smart. And the first exam I gave, she made 100 on it. A lot of kids have high hopes when school starts. And so I called her mother. And I told her who I am and I'm calling about her daughter, Tressa. And she made a hundred on the first major test. It's gonna be a good year, you push it home and I'll pull at school and we'll, we'll go, we'll learn things. And there was dead silence on the other side of that phone. I couldn't even hear anybody breathing. So I, I don't know if she passed out or what, so I kept holding. But she made a statement I'll never forget. She said, you're the first teacher to ever call me and tell me anything that my child has done that's right. So you know what kind of call she was expecting. You know how much trouble I had out of Tressa? Zero. Anything I asked, she would do it. Then I started calling. I'd never tell the students I was calling. I'll never forget, I had a young man named Billy and he had an image in the classroom so he didn't want anybody to know that somebody might call his mother. But he made a high score on the test and I called his mother and told her and you know, the same spiel. And uh, he came in the next morning, walking real quietly and kind of leaned up next to me and said, you called my mother last night, didn't you? And I leaned back over and said, yes. <laughs> and it changed his life. Then I got the idea of calling fathers. You know, usually on those little cards we had, now you can look them up on the computer, you know, it has the contact person, it's usually the mother. The father gets involved when everything's falling apart. And I love to call the father that it was maybe a divorce situation, he was not living in the home. 
because I was trying to get him back involved in the life of the kid. And so when I had good news, I'd call the father if I had a name. And this got to be kind of devious. <laughs> because I would call and I, I would listen. And say, if it's in an office complex, they would say, Bill, it's the high school calling. And you know what he thought? What has he done now? And often I could hear this person come up to the phone and stop, take a deep breath, really hesitant on even talking to me. And when I said, your son or your daughter just made a high score in my class, I want to encourage them, want you to encourage them. It, it revolutionized lots of things. Everybody loves to be bragged on. And sometimes as teachers, I hope you find ways to do that. That may be a little different. Put laughter in your life. Dr. Bob says that, does he not? Put laughter in your life. Don't let negative experiences destroy your joy as a teacher. Okay? Okay. You may, had a, you may have had a situation where you didn't feel an administrator backed you enough. You may have a parent or a group of parents come after you and wrongfully accuse you of something. You may have a student you can't manage and you can't get the office to do anything about this student. So what has happened? You've allowed that to destroy your joy in teaching. There were two times in my career that I got really negative. And one was in Texas and a student wrote me a note one day and I'd never had a note like this in all of my years of teaching. You don't like us, do you? I still can barely bear to, to say that. What was interesting about that, they were the class I liked the best. And then I tried to think, what are you doing? What attitude are you portraying? What's going on there? And in a few months, I had that straightened out and I got another note. We know you want us to be the best we can be. And I knew I'd won them over. But see, don't, don't let, let this, these situations destroy your laughter because kids are funny. One of my teachers, her first year teaching, she sent me an email one day and said, Dr. Simpson, you run a fine teacher ed program, but there's something you didn't teach me. She said, like a dutiful teacher, kindergarten teacher, I went to the bus my first day of school to meet my students. I was all dressed up and had a nice new pair of white sandals on. And my first kid stepped off the bus and when he stepped off the bus, he threw up all over me. <laughs> and she said, I had to go back to the uh, back to the school with those new white sandals with vomit sloshing between my toes. <laughs> and I said, no, we didn't practice that during student teaching seminar. <laughs> I couldn't get anybody to volunteer to throw up. <laughs> then we had a teacher come in and they were doing pronunciation of a, a vowel and a constant OR sound. And she asked this, I think he was a second grader. Do you know a word that has O-R in it? <laughs> you know what's coming, don't you? <laughs> and he said, porn. <laughs> now, you'll have to be a native of Southern Appalachia to get the rest of this, okay? And she said, I didn't know what to do, so I finally just turned and asked him, well, what do you mean by porn? He said, oh, you know, Miss Smith, it's porn down rain. <laughs> Yeah, we love the King's English over here, don't we? <laughs> then we had in the middle school, had an eighth grade party and a kid brought a milk jug full of liquor. And the teacher got it and said, where did you get this? And he said, Papaw made it. <laughs> so there can't be anything wrong with it since Papaw made it. And uh, you remember the Waltons, the two sisters, the recipe. Yeah. Sad part to this, in a way. The little kid came back to the office and was talking to the principal, and he said, please don't let my papa get in trouble. I did that. He didn't do it. 
My, my dad left us a long time ago. My mother doesn't want us to live with him, and the only place we have to live is with Papa. So please don't do anything to Papa. About two, we tell all of our graduates when they get to be teach, when they get named teacher of the year, they have to call us before they call their mother. <laughs> and some of them actually do, but we don't hear all of them. But about two years ago, I was checking emails and, and beginning to get these emails. I was teacher of the year in my school. I was teacher of the year and so forth. And I called Lucas and I said, Dr. Lucas, we have a panel. You contact all you can and get these kids here to talk to our student teachers. And she got about eight that had been named teacher of the year that year. And uh, we let them talk to our student teachers. One thing they said, you find the most positive teacher in your school and you make that person your new best friend. And it will revolutionize you as a teacher because you'll be around positive aspects of teaching. They know what I say. Do not go into the teacher's lounge. <laughs> it is often a den of vipers in there. <laughs> be with positive people, right? This is a tough one we're facing. And I think Marsh already said I had a unique opportunity of going to Saudi Arabia to discuss critical thinking, which lasted about five minutes. And they got in this huge argument in Arabic and critical thinking was over. But I did learn a lot and had a lot, and had a lot of experiences. But we're battling this here with freedom of, what does freedom of religion mean? Does it mean freedom for everyone? Would you give freedom to these three people, freedom of religion? The middle young lady is from Indonesia. Yes, she's Muslim. And she admitted to me that some religious groups, including Christians, are you know, actually persecuted in her country. And what I hope she discovered from us is that religious freedom will work because she's a bright young lady. And I keep up with her. She sends emails every so often. Now she's a mother of two. And it's, it's just very interesting to have that interaction and, and have a foreign student from a country where your religion is against the law. That's a strange feeling. So in that little trip I made to Saudi Arabia, uh, I would uh, stay at the... I think the Marriott in Riyadh and somebody from the U S embassy would come by and pick me up in a van and take me to the ministry of education. And one morning he picked me up and, uh, he turned around and said, do you celebrate Easter? Now I, I'm shamefully, I, I hesitated because I was wondering if he was trying to set me up or what he's trying to do. And I finally thought about it for a minute and I said, you know, if I don't have the backbone to stand for what I believe in, how can I expect my students to, right? And so I said, yes, I do. And he said, you know, I'm from India and I celebrate Easter too. And we talked about the differences in, in how they did that. But I get this call on a Friday night and it's the guy I work with, Mohammed. And he said, we want to take you out to a traditional restaurant and have a meal. You want to go with us? I said, yeah, sure, I'll go. And so I go down to the first floor and start waiting, and he pulls up in his car. And he starts driving through Riyadh and showing me places and things that they do. And Riyadh is a modern city, if you've ever been there. And then we go on the outside of the city. I get a little tense here because no traffic, no street lights. And we drive up somewhere and stop on the side of the road. And he gets out of his car and starts tropping down through, trucking down through the desert. I didn't know what to do. So I was right behind him going down through the desert. <laughs> and he said, you don't mind if I have three friends to come over, do you? Well, what am I supposed to say? And I said, no. And so in a minute, this car pulls up. Now, remember, there's no street lights. It's pitch dark. And these three guys come up and they find us down in the desert and they unroll a little carpet 
and sit down on it. And one happened to be the director of religious education for the country of Saudi Arabia. Their goal that night was to convert me to Islam. Seriously. Okay. I don't know why I wasn't scared out of my mind because telling you that right now, I'm scared out of my mind. <laughs> and we started talking about the difference. Well, two or three things surprised them. How much I knew about Islam was one thing. And the other thing that I could counter that I don't think they've ever experienced in their life, I could counter almost everything they said from the Quran with something from the Bible. I did learn a few Bible verses over my life. And this conversation continued as we went back to a restaurant. But it was the most unusual experience I guess I've ever had. And it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about people and how you relate to people. This is a statement I like when I teach students about how to deal with religion in public schools comes from a Supreme Court case. The place of religion in our society is an exalted one. In the relationship between man and religion, the state is firmly committed to a position of neutrality. I hope you can say amen to that. Roger Williams, you know Roger Williams, the founding of this country, Roger Williams? He made this statement. It is less hurtful to compel a man to marry someone he does not love than to follow, follow a religion in which he does not believe. And he was probably the most outspoken person in, in this area. This is what I try to teach my students. If you're going to disagree with somebody or something, an idea... You have to understand the idea before you disagree with it. If you don't, you are disagreeing in ignorance. And you're going to do more harm than good. So just keep your mouth shut. Okay? But you have to understand what you're dealing with. I am not in the business of reproducing the social classes. Listen, there are people that would like to keep raising the GPA requirement for teachers because they have this idea that we're gonna get all these smarter people into teaching. Now, let me tell you something. Here at this institution, I'll get off my soapbox in a minute, but I'm gonna get on right now. At this institution, the average GPA of the kids and teacher Lossinger is higher than the average GPA of Maryville College as a whole. Great. That's, that's just not here either. That's in lots of places. But there are some people that have a misguided idea about that. The correlation between higher standardized test scores, academic achievement, is social class. The higher the income of the family, the better the scores are. Now, I'm not a fool. I know... Correlation is not cause and effect. But when you get the same positive correlation over and over again, you better take a look at it. Okay? Because I, this to Maryville College I'm talking right now. Please leave this college like Isaac Anderson found it. A place where kids from Appalachia could come and study and you're going to work with them. You're going to you know, spend hours with them at times to try to get them where they're going to graduate from college. Because you take a young man or a young lady that lives in one of these valleys up through here in, in the mountains in a, in a mobile home that's about to fall down and you have a broken down car out front. You know what I'm talking about, right? There are kids in that mobile home and there are kids somebody could reach. And if we reach them, we will revolutionize the life of that child. I'm not concerned about the kid that will be successful in everybody's college. I'm concerned about the kid that may be successful only if we take the time with him at Maryville College.
When I went off to college in Nashville as a freshman, I was scared to death. I was scared to death because I was afraid I would fail and not only embarrass myself, but embarrass my family. And it took people to help me through those early years to get the confidence that I needed. And so I hope that we'll always do that here. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, Lutheran pastor, World War II, opposed Hitler, joined the plot to assassinate Hitler even though he was a pastor and a pacifist and was executed by the Nazis just a few weeks before his prison camp was liberated by the Allies. And he wrote this statement. The ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world that it leaves to its children. Listen, listen to the old man up here, okay? Our children have the right to be safe at school. Our teachers, our teachers have the right to teach without having a gun strapped to them. Our teachers have the right to teach. Some school district gave them many baseball bats today. In our my personal rights dominated society, some rights supersede other rights. And I believe the right of our children to be safe should be at the top of the list of rights. So I ask you to fight for what's right for our children. My grandchildren sitting down here still in school, I want them to be safe. I don't want them to go to school afraid. There's a passage in the Bible that I read, 2 Thessalonians. Paul wrote to this church, and he had been their teacher. People were involved in Christianity because of him. And he was talking to them about how much he appreciated them. And he's talking about the end of time. Now, there's one, one big reason I hold on to my faith. And that is everybody will give an account one day. I don't know how that'll happen. And I'm not concerned about you because I'm concerned about myself. Because you see a sinful man up here. But he wrote to this church and he said, you are my hope, my joy, and the crown in which I will glory in the presence of the Lord. Let me tell you something. My Bible says we are to meet the needs of all children, poor children, children with no father, children in broken homes, and we are to meet those needs. And I will stand on that day telling our Lord that when I trained you guys, I gave it all I had because you are my crown of rejoicing when that day comes. Because I believe in what we tried to teach you. And I believe that deep down inside you have a commitment for children because I've done that all of my life. Didn't make me rich, but I'm going to tell you something. I wouldn't swap it for anything. God placed me here for a little while. I did my best while I was here. I worked as hard as I knew how, too hard, too hard at times. But I, I believe in you. I believe in you. And I will always believe in you because I know what's deep down in your heart because I helped put it there. Okay? And when you go out to school in the morning, Friday, it's the morning, in the morning Friday, what are you putting in their hearts? What are you putting in their hearts? I was at one of our high schools about a year ago in the secretary, they know everything. <laughs> and I'd never had this statement. 
It's bad, Jennifer. But the secretary was talking to me, and she said, are you going to put student teachers here next year? And I said, yes. She said, good, because your student teachers are such a blessing. My goodness. So I go to the student teacher meeting that night, and I say, be a blessing. Be a blessing. Because that makes a difference in the world in which we live. See, I, I'm tired. I get tired. And I long for a new day. I long for the day when I will never turn on TV and hear about a group of students being shot in the school. I long for a day when I will not pick up a Daily Times and see a story about a child sexually molested by a family member. I long for a day when I'll never hear that in our state, a 12-year-old is kidnapped off the streets and forced into sexual slavery, and it happens in our state. I long for the day when another child will not be taken to the hospital because they've been beaten by a drunken and mad father. I long for a day when there will not be children forced into rebel armies around the world. I long for that day when children will be treated the way children should be treated, as the most precious gift we have. And as I leave this position and move to Tyler, Texas, I leave it with a heavy heart. Not because I'm the only person that can do something, I'm the least. But we got down and we worked hard. We worked real hard. And I want to look back one day and say, they're keeping on, right? For the last time for many of you, this is good for a lifetime. Bless you, my children.